equipment, which was um, uh, underground detector in uh, Grand Sasso uh, for um, astrophysics purposes, neutrinos. Uh, and uh, then he discovered the colliders and uh, moved to CERN as a CERN fellow and worked on the UA2 experiment, which simultaneously with UA1, Carlo Rubin's experiment discovered W and Z in the 80s. Um, then he uh, moved to Fermilab around uh, uh, 1990 and uh, became uh, a member of CDF collaboration and worked from the very beginning of CDF uh, on many things, including B physics and uh, discovery of the top quark in 1995. And then uh, around 2000, he moved to University of California in Santa Barbara. And uh, about the same time, he also joined the CMS experiment and uh, was working on CMS and uh, CDF for a while and then just CMS experiment where he became a spokesperson in 2012 and led the Higgs discovery uh, in CMS um, during his spokespersonship uh, term in 2012 and 2013. So today, Joe is going to talk uh, um, uh, about uh, things post Higgs, uh, from Higgs to dark matter. Please welcome Joe Incandela. Greg, for that very nice introduction. Thank you all for uh, coming out for this talk. Let's see. Maybe I'll put it on the side, which slide is that? Can you hear me okay? Yeah? All right, so this is kind of, uh, um, this talk is kind of motivated or inspired by the various things I'm working on now. So it's a little bit of a hodgepodge, but I tried to pull it into one story. Hopefully it works for you. Um, and ooh. okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, what's going on, what's where things stand in, in particle physics, and um, and what some of the big challenges are today, and what we're doing. All right, so first of all, you have to know a little bit about particle physics. Uh, what we think we understand well is mostly described by what we call the standard model. And this is something that's been developed over about the last 100 years. It's been made possible by the discovery of many subatomic particles and many theoretical uh, innovations. And in some sense has created um, a new per a periodic table of the fundamental particles. And that's shown here. So we have only a small number of elementary particles. I saw Carlo Rubia, who Greg mentioned, was a famous physicist at CERN, still at CERN still famous, and he once gave a talk. He slapped, in fact, it was one that had plastic tr transparencies and overhead machines like that. He slapped the transparency down, showing this information, and he said, after 100 years and billions of dollars, this is all we know. Uh, but that's a good thing. We want it to be simple. Um, so, and the interesting thing, too, is it's very simple. It's actually described by one simple equation. <laughs> and it's made up of fermions. This is Enrico Fermi. I like to show this picture because this equation is wrong. <laughs> right, it should be e squared over h bar c. But I'm sure he didn't write that. I'm just warning you if you ever have somebody who wants to take a picture of you at, this, at the chalkboard, check the board. <laughs> and Sachandra uh, Nath Bose, who wrote to Einstein, and Einstein actually read his letter about um, statistics for boson. What we now call boson because of him. Oops, but we know this can't be the full story, okay? There are many things that aren't explained, and I'll repeat this a few times and talk about some of the things we're looking for. First of all, the standard model is a model, it's not a theory, it's an effective theory with many unanswered questions. We don't understand why the masses are what they are. There's a big, big difference between the electron mass and the heaviest particle, which is the top. We certainly don't understand the neutrino masses where they came from. And we don't understand why we're at this energy scale, what we call the electroweak scale, which is between, say, 100 GeV and a 2 EV, where we find interactions or masses of, of particles. The only natural scale is the Planck scale in the standard model, which is way higher. And in fact, the Higgs, which I'll return to, requires kind of extraordinary gymnastics to explain. 
So there's the issue, in fact, is that if you do higher order corrections to behave in mass, the kind of classical bare mass, um, you find that the corrections are huge, particularly for third generation quarks and, and vector bosons. And they drive the mass corrections up to the quantum scale, okay, which is 10 to the 19 GeV. And we found the Higgs at about 10 to the 2 GeV. So we're only off by 17 orders of magnitude. And this is a theoretical and or philosophical problem. One possibility is that if you tune the standard model parameters well enough, everything cancels out, and you get the right mass. But this is the cancellation that you'd be looking at, something like 34 decimal places, which doesn't seem very natural to us. That's where the term natural comes from. You know, we don't know many systems that accidentally happen to be that well balanced. I mean, there's, there's a famous story of the sun and the moon. You know, the moon eclipses the sun almost perfectly, like within 1%. But we don't claim that nature did that on purpose. That's just a act of coincidence, right? The other possibility is that there are partner particles to the standard model, so that these partners, when you do the calculation, the terms that go to the Planck scale actually get canceled. And that's shown here. And we'd like to think that maybe that's the case. And there are examples of other systems where a value, a property was at a value not expected given the natural scale, and there's some symmetry that protects it. And so this is what we're looking for. And a lot of this uh, probing of the lecture week scale has been done at the LHC. It was intended to be done at the LHC. The LHC was designed to do this. And in particular, it was designed to cover all possible Higgs mass values that we thought were allowed given our knowledge of uh, phenomenology, essentially. So that was roughly 100 to 1,000 times the, Higgs uh, the proton mass. And we wanted to search for new particles, particularly particles that could be these partners that we're looking for to help understand why the Higgs is where it's at. This shows the schedule. It took a long time. First studies began in 1984, and didn't start operating until really till 2009. So it took a quarter of a century to go from you know, first discussions to actual operation. And then the Higgs was discovered in this is an inside view of the tunnel. The biggest challenge was building the superconducting magnets that keep the particles on circular track. There are about 1,200 of these. The ring itself is 27 kilometers. You have eight Tesla magnets to give you a seven TeV per beam energy. And this used something like 7,600 kilometers of niobium titanium cable. And it's operated at superfluid temperatures not just liquid helium temperatures, but actually below, one point, below two degrees to go superfluid. And it's 120 tons of helium. So it's a quite a big uh, cryo system. This shows you the bending, the, the momentum that you can handle for a given magnet strength and radius. So obviously, the bigger you go, the weaker your magnets can be for a given momentum that you want to have for your particles. Or if you push as large as you can with the strongest magnets you can, you can go to the highest energy possible. And that's basically what was done for the LHC. Now, in 2015, the collision energy went up from 8 to 13 TeV. And this was after repairing magnets. As you may or may not recall, there was an accident in 2008. We discovered a faulty kind, a fault in the design, if you like, of the magnet connection. And so we decided to run at slightly lower current. And now we're moving closer to the uh, final design energy, which is 14. OK, I want to tell you about the experiments. There are four major experiments. I'm only going to tell you about two. There's ATLAS, uh, which is our competitor, and the CMS experiment, which I'm on. I just want to show you these really quickly. This is the schematic uh, view of the ATLAS detector. Um, its weight is 7,000 tons, which is actually the weight of the Eiffel Tower, to give you some idea. And there are about 3,000 kilometers of cables. This is from Providence to Denver, I just showed. Uh, it's 150 feet long, uh, more than six stories tall. Those sh you can see some people. <coughs> and the size and the mass are, are really determined by what you need to measure the momentum and energy of high energy particles. You have magnetic field, charged particles, their trajectory is, is, is curved in a magnetic field, right? So if you have very high energy particles, to curve them, you have to have either a very strong magnet, magnetic field or a long lever arm over which you're measuring. 
Atlas has a kind of a medium scale magnetic field and very large Leveron. And it has about 100 million independent sensing elements. Uh, in every event, you track about 100,000 particles, something like this. We have an event every 25 nanoseconds. Um, and you end up inferring a lot of radiation up to 10 to the 15 neutrons per square centimeter. And I'll come back to that, because that's one of the limi limiting factors in these detectors. They eventually incur too much radiation damage to the human. So there's something like 38 countries, 200 institutions, um, lots of scientific authors. And this is, again, another person. This is as they were building Atlas before they filled it with the full detector. These are just the large choroidal uh, magnetic uh, rings. Inside the detectors, you have basically every square or cubic inch filled with uh, high-tech detection elements, which I won't go through it into in great detail, but I'll give you some examples of some of the new ones that were, were developed. CMS was actually uh, built in segments on the surface and then lowered, um, each segment being several million pounds, had to be lowered 300 feet. So that had to be done with care. Um, and you can see there are four, four cables, it looks like, that hold these objects. I gave a, gave a talk like this to high school students, and one of the students said, what are those cables made of? And I had no idea, so I went back and found out. And it turns out that each cable is made of 52 one inch thick steel cables. And every one of those steel cables went to a separate reel, which was monitored by an engineer. There were 208 engineers monitoring the lowering of these things from a Swiss company. And the reason being that if, if the tensions were not balanced properly, the thing would start to rock or play or twist. And there were only three centimeters of clearance. <laughs> so it was worth the 208 engineers, I guess. Everything came down without damage. So here's the uh, installation of the tracker, which uh, I contributed to, and also Brown University, many of the faculty here, being installed. So the total weight of CMS is two Eiffel Towers, actually, so 14,000 uh, tons. The height is four stories, length about 100 feet, and actually, um, it's much smaller than Atlas, okay, but much heavier. And it's the reason for that is that it has much stronger magnetic field, which is a giant superconducting magnet, which means that the particles, tr uh, arc, uh, their trajectories are arced more strongly, so you don't need as big of a lever arm. On the other hand, you have a lot of magnetic field, and you got to somehow contain it. So all this orange material that you see is iron. Lots and lots of iron is stuck in the magnetic field. But if, if you go down there, even so, if you're down there when the magnetic field's on, and you have, you know, you have some keys in your hand or something, they just flap, you know, they, they immediately look like this, you know, and you can erase your credit cards and all kinds of fun stuff. Okay, so it's it's also, it's actually, I found out we have 47 countries now, um, and it's a, few, a somewhat fewer number of total people than, than Atlas. And inside CMS, again, there's lots of high-tech equipment. There's the, the tracker, which is all semiconductors. We have a calorimeter that uses uh, lead tungstate crystals. Okay, let me give you some of the results from the LAC so far. We've been running for several years. Uh, oh, sorry, I had this out of order. I wanted to mention that Brown is also heavily involved in CMS. And you have, um, they've actually been one of the biggest contributors to the program. They have a lot of leadership in the physics, um, in the tracking system, and they're playing a big role in the upgrades. I won't talk about the upgrades they're doing because they can tell you about that, but I'll tell you about some of the upgrades I'm working on, which are actually related, also use silicon. Here's a picture of the faculty, um, postdocs, and senior researchers. It's actually a very big group, four faculty, seven postdocs, senior researchers, and again, something like eight grad students. So it's a fairly big group, and they're playing a very big role. Okay, so getting back to some of the early results, I was a little bit out of order there. What you see here are different processes, and this is the kind of a measure of the rate at which, the relative rate at which they occur. So you can see that you have stuff that's uh, detected um, with maybe uh, not so rare to things that are maybe eight orders of magnitude less likely to be seen. And these different processes were what we saw basically as a function of time. You see the, initially you see the ones that were the most uh, highly occurring, and then you drop and you start looking at these really rare, rare processes. But the whole point 
showing you this is that we've looked at many, many different rare processes, and we see them. And if you look at the, the dots with the bars going vertical, that shows you the actual measurements. The horizontal bars give you the prediction. And everything is matching pretty well to uh, what's been predicted. In fact, part of the reason for this is that the theoretical community has done uh, a tremendous job of doing high, higher order calculations of what these processes would be like. So you do, you do the calculations in perturbation theory. Um, so you go leading order, fairly straightforward calculation, next leading order, next to next leading order, next to next to next to leading order. You look at additional terms, which each time give you a better approximation of what the process should be. And it sounds like it's not so bad, but you know it could take five to 10 years to do a next next correction in some of these calculations. So it's very, very hard to do. So I show you the same curve that I showed before for CMS, but now for Atlas, showing all these different processes. And I just wanted to point out that th these, all these processes that I was showing you were actually a factor of about one million below the total interaction rate. So you're beginning already here to look at processes that are sort of one in a million, proton, proton collision looking all the way down to about 1 in 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 14th, 10 to the 14th. And that's where we sit. We have to have a very, very good control of our background to be able to pick things out that are that rare. And the results actually from the new running have been already very impressive. We already have very good measurements of top course. Uh, this is Wu plus Jet. CMS looking at the cross-section for top is matching the theoretical line very well, as you can see for single top core production. Now, I want to switch and talk a little bit about the Higgs. The Higgs boson used to be called the uh, holy grail of physics. And so <coughs> the question you might ask now is, is the cup, is that grail full or empty, or half full or half empty? Uh, by which I mean, can we learn something from the Higgs? Will it reveal something to us? Precision measurements of its properties, we hope, could tell us about what comes beyond the standard model. All right, so what we've learned so far is kind of shown here. We look at, um, we look at various decay products. I mean, Higgs decaying by various channels. We think we understand how it's produced in these different processes uh, leading to these decays. And we look at, if you like, the strength of interaction with these particles as a function of their mass. We can extract all that information just by looking at various channels and doing a global fit. And if it really is a Higgs, the Higgs is what gives particles mass, meaning more massive particles will couple to it more strongly, so the Higgs will decay more often to more massive particles. And sure enough, you see there's kind of a linear dependence when you take into account the constant factor of uh, out front pressure. So it starts to look very much like a Higgs, sorry. The other thing is uh, the rates, the rates can be compared to what's expected from the standard model, which would be this point one here. So if you look at the production cross-section versus uh, divided by the standard model, we get something that's very consistent with one. So what we find seems to be very much like a standard model. Another thing you can check is that, is it really a spin zero particle with positive parity? The way we do that is we look at how it decays, we look at where the decay products go, and their angular distributions can give us a lot of information about the underlying spin of the Higgs and its parity. And we compare in pairwise steps. So we'll, we'll look at, an, at various distributions, and we'll do a comparison of how the data fits for spin zero, positive parity, and some other hypothesis. And you can do like a ratio of likelihoods and see which one it prefers. And we do that here, and you can see the data are the glass dots. The yellow bands are what you'd get if the Higgs were standard model like. And then these are all alternative descriptions with different kinds of spin, spin zero, spin one, uh, spin two, different models. And you can see it always prefers the uh, spin zero case. So this actually was information we already had in 2013. And uh, I just want to tell you a little anecdote, which is kind of funny. Um, we had announced the discovery of the Higgs in July of 2012, but
but at the time we didn't call it a haze. We said it was haze light because we weren't. It was still fresh. I mean, the discovery came two weeks before the announcement. We didn't want to make any mistakes, so we called it haze light, pending further information. So by March of 2013, we had done these kind of studies, and we concluded it really is probably the haze. In the meantime, the, the, the media were, were hounding us, asking us whether we're going to call this thing. The Higgs or what? And, and Greg found this interesting. Uh, it turned out that the day we announced that we went on record claiming it was really the Higgs boson was the day that they collected a new pope. And so we saw this uh, this funny uh, headline. All right, I won't say anything about the God particle. I'm trying to think of a good joke. But I can't think of one. Another thing we do, um, I should say, that the Higgs. In the standard model, everything is predicted about the Higgs, except its mass. That was the one, one thing that was uncertain. And now it's been measured. We have a combined result, mass and CMS data together. And we know it's already 0.2%, which is pretty remarkably good. And if you take that mass and you combine it with all other data from lots of other measurements and so forth, we find that everything is self-consistent. Okay, as I said, the only thing that was missing standard model theory was the mass, but once you include the mass, the theory is over-constrained, and you can see if everything's self-consistent, and it is. And by the way, it's still there. If you look at the 13 TV data, which is just one example, we find that there is uh, a very good signal in the Higgs QG for leptons, and again, the strength of that signal is really pretty much bang on what you expect from the standard model, albeit with fairly large uncertainty. So you might ask, is if all we're saying is the standard model, is the standard model, um, is everything else being hidden from us at the LHC? Is all this, is all this seem to be seen as the standard model? And the answer is yes, so far, but we're not done yet. So we have a long way to go, and I'll, I'll tell you a bit about what we're doing and, and uh, what are some of the physics goals and how we're going after it. Now, one thing that's interesting to point out is that this mass, uh, which we now know is 125, okay, at the time that this person uh, agreed to offer hour, we gave a talk, it was estimated to be 125, 26, now we know it's 125. That turned out to be kind of just where no one expected, which I like. I mean, when, when I say no one, I'm talking about theoretical physics. Um, we experimentalists had no a priori uh, bias. But it turns out, if you believe that it's Supersymmetric um, Higgs, you'd expect its mass to be lower in most QG theories that were popular. And if you expected it to be a standard model Higgs, it should be a little bit heavier. So it kind of fell right in between, which is already kind of interesting. And a hint for something. And what we want to do is understand, this shows you the, 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 Higgs, the Higgs vector in the standard model Lagrangian. These are the couplings of the Higgs to the vector bosons. These are the couple couplings of the Higgs to the fermions. What we want to do in the future is measure these couplings to other particles with very high precision. And as this person said, Guido Alfarelli is pointing out, it would be really astonishing if we find no deviation from the standard model. The question, though, is how precise do we have to measure this? So our hope is to do a pretty good job at the LHC. And the way we're going to do that is to try to collect a lot more data starting this year, actually, at higher, and high, at higher energy, and just run for a very long time with a, a continuously increasing beam intensity. Well, there'll be steps, I should say, but we're going to make some jump in the intensity of the beam to get more and more collisions. The higher uh, collision rate gives us more statistics more rapidly. So here, here you see in various decay processes how many um, events we had in different channels. 10 to a few hundred. By the end of 2018, you can see there'll be about a factor of six improvement, maybe more in some cases, maybe tens more. And by 2037, when the LHC stops running, uh, we'll have many, many thousands of each. And with that, we'll try to have much more uh, precise measurements. This gives you some, somewhat of a feel for the time scale of, of these kinds of studies that we do. This actually takes a very long time for us to understand uh, the elementary part of the universe these days, but the 
that's almost always been the case at some level. So our initial measurement uh, on the coupling was sort of 10 to 25 percent uncertainty. We need about three percent uncertainty to really probe new particles that are contributing to the coupling. And here's a bunch of different models. These are um, kind of the uncertainties or the ratios of couplings that one would be looking at. So we need to have precisions in the order of a few percent, if you like, on the coupling to, to really see if there are deviations that would match these kinds of models. So by the end of running, uh, we'll be able to get down to the two to eight percent level in most of the uh, couplings. And we'll also have access to very important uh, rare decays. So this shows the couplings, if you like, the photon, W, Z, gluon, B, et cetera, et cetera. And we think we'll be able to do a few percent. But it'll take 20 or 30 years. There's one other thing that's interesting about uh, Hayes, and that's relation its relationship to the top quark, which is the heaviest of all particles that we know. It turns out that in really the most important models we know, including supersymmetry and, and models with new space-time uh, dimensions, it's the coupling of the Higgs field to the top quark and its partners, whatever they may be, that causes the Higgs field to actually develop what's called a symmetry-breaking uh, value in all space. And this is actually what's responsible for creation of massive particles. You've heard of Higgs giving particles mass. It's actually the Higgs mechanism this uh, critical phase transition that occurs via this interaction with the top quark um, that actually generates that formation of massive uh, elementary particles. So another thing we're very interested in is the third generation of quarks, which includes the top, and its relationship to Higgs. Now there's an interest, some interesting asides of that. It turns out that uh, once you know the Higgs mass well and the top quark mass well, you can start to look at the um, potential energy distribution for the Higgs. And you can look at, you can actually understand the shape of the potential in which the universe lives. And there's a question. If, if that shape is very, if the, the potential well is shallow, okay, those of you who know quantum mechanics know that if you have a shallow well, it's possible to tunnel out. So if it's very shallow, the universe can be metastable, meaning at some point it tunnels out changes its potential. If it's a very deep potential, it can be very stable. And lo and behold, it turns out we're somewhere in between. So the universe is kind of in a metastable state as far as we can tell. And we need to understand uh, the standard model parameters better to understand how stable it is or what might be its mean lifetime. And that means we have to get the top mass and the Higgs mass measured much better. With the HLRG, we think we'll be able to get down to sort of these levels, a couple hundred MeV on the top mass, and Higgs mass maybe down to about 50 MeV. So we'll be able to shrink those circles and determine where we are and whether we really are in a critical stage or, or um, a stable stage or if the universe is metastable and what its lifetime will be. So that's kind of interesting. So looking to the future, uh, we know there has to be new physics. We know the standard models can't be the whole story. There's just way too many things we can't uh, explain. So what comes next? Well, probably the favorite thing is supersymmetry. Now, supersymmetry is a symmetry, if you like, you can think of it as kind of a mirror reflection of the standard model with one distortion or two. And, and what that distortion is, is that for every standard model particle that you have, if it's a boson, supersymmetry will reflect it into a fermion. For every boson, there's a fermion. For every fermion, there's a boson. Uh, and probably the masses aren't quite equal. Because if they were, we should have already found it. So we think supersymmetry is there. If it's there, it's heavier. Now, there's some benefits of QZ, which is why people like it. Uh, for one thing, it unifies the strength of all the, uh, all the, all the forces that we study other than gravity. And uh, I asked the most brilliant physicist I know if he believed in supersymmetry, and he said yes, and I asked him why, and he said because of this. So without supersymmetry, as you go to higher and higher energy, the coupling strengths of the different forces get closer to each other, but they don't quite merge. When you introduce supersymmetry, they merge really well. And we believe that you know, simplicity is an important uh, part of the universe. 
very straight and important guide for people to use. So this is very attractive. It also predicts that there should be a lightest Higgs boson, neutral, CP even Higgs boson with a mass less than 130, and we found one with 125. But I told you that that's still a little bit uh, dicey for people to intrude. And it pro provides clues to the dark side of the universe. So I have to tell you about the dark side. There is a cosmological connection, and maybe some of you know this. Um, it was believed, if you look at the luminous matter in galaxies, it's believed that as you get further and further away, the gravitational attraction up from the center gets weaker and weaker, and as the galaxy rotates, stars far from the center should be lagging more and more. So you'd expect the velocity to tail off as you moved away from the center of the galaxy. And people looking at you know, galaxies edge on and looking at the red and blue shift to determine those speeds as a function of radius, and they found that, in fact, it increases. This was completely unexpected. And if you like, it means that what we think is true now, although many other alternative explanations were considered and ruled out mostly, is that there's some kind of matter that we don't see in which these stars are embedded. Imagine if we were a solid, right? And you had a solid spinning, the further out you go, the faster you go, because everybody's spinning at the same frequency, there's a larger radius. So it's like the stars are connected somehow to some gravitational matter that's not quite a solid, but it's certainly there. We, we call that the dark matter. So we have to talk a little bit about the dark side. We now know that only about 1 in 5% of the universe is ordinary matter, stuff that the standard model uh, explains well. 28% is dark matter. Two of the uh, supersymmetry actually has very good dark matter candidates, and it predicts them in the right amount in the universe now. And this is called uh, something of a miracle. The remaining 67% of the energy in the universe is what we call dark energy. Uh, we're not really sure what this is. It'll probably be taxed someday. Maybe the Department of Dark Energy, I don't know. Right? <laughs> anyway, we're going to, we have been looking for this. We haven't been able to find it. And uh, we're going to continue looking. And this is sort of projections in, in, in mass planes of how well we'll do once we have all the data from the LHC and the next time we see it. So we'll be able to look for partners of the gluon, it's called the Gluino, out to like 2400 gas. This is the neutralino, um, Sargino. There are many different things we've studied. We'll be able to push out to fairly high masses looking for this, um, this supersymmetry. But it may not be that the universe is supersymmetric. There are lots of other theories particularly the absence of any evidence for supersymmetry so far has put people off. Uh, they thought we would find it much earlier. And many of these new theories, other than supersymmetry, are like supersymmetry in the sense that they predict the existence of partner particles that give you the cancellation you need to keep the Higgs mass stable. Or uh, they, they predict the existence of additional uh, spatial dimensions. I list some of these theories here, and there are lots more, and, and, and many, many being developed all the time. But one thing that's good is that if you don't know what exactly what you're looking for, it's very useful to have a, a Hadron Collider. Hadron Colliders actually give you access to different energy scales and different kinds of particles simultaneously, and, and you have very high cross-sections for producing all kinds of things. All right, so what will it take for us to continue? I, I said we're going to try to get lots of Higgs bosons study lots more data. How will we do that? Well, it turns out, as I mentioned, radiation damages our detectors. At a certain point, they won't function well, and we have to replace them. Or, simply, because we're going to so much higher beam intensity, the detectors can't really uh, help us disentangle what's going on in these things, and they have to be improved. So here I show you an event, a simulated event, in which there are 50 pairs of protons colliding. Okay? And remember I told you that when I showed you that chart of the different processes um, that we've been measuring, we started at one in a million, and we worked
make their way down. So interesting events are rare. There are at least one a million. So if you have 50 interactions, okay, the chances are at best one of them is interesting. Okay. But you have to deal with all of the particles coming from all the others. So this is like a background noise to us. And we call this pileup. We have a pileup of many different interactions. Now, for the current experiments, we're looking at 50 to 60 simultaneous proton-proton interactions. This is what's shown in this simulation. I guess I could find real events now that have this. And as I said, we call this pile up or PU. And for that, we've made some upgrades to the detectors already to handle that. And then when we go to the high luminosity LHC, we're going to have something like 140 to 200 simultaneous interactions. So what you see in this picture will be multiplied by a factor of three or four. And to do this, we need more sophisticated detectors and techniques to handle all of this. And in particular, we need granularity, meaning we need lots more sensing elements of smaller sizes to be able to distinguish between nearby particles uh, interacting with the detector. All right, so this shows the goals of the high luminosity LHC. Um, this shows the luminosity, which means, if you like, the beam intensity that we, we're, we're considering. This is the duration in which the proton beams are in the, in the machine and interacting. And the colors tell you how much data you collect. So there's a possibility that we run at 5 times 10 to the 34. And we collect about 250 inverse femtobonds of data per year. To give you an idea, the data that we took in three years uh, from 2009 through 2012 was about 25 inverse femtobonds. So we're going to go to about 10 times that per year. Or we may run at even higher intensity, and therefore piling up 200 events per collision, and go up to over 300 um, in the sense of per year. So we have to design, if you like, to operate detectors that can actually disentangle what's going on when there are 200 proton-proton interactions simultaneously. And this is happening every 25 nanoseconds, and therefore it needs very good radiation tolerance. So I thought I would just tell you very briefly uh, about one example that I'm working on. But, uh, but before I do that, I'll show you what's happening to this, to this CMS experiment as a whole. We're going to extend our muon system, which are on the outside of the detector. There's going to be a tremendous amount of work. On, we're going to completely replace the tracking system. And a lot of that work will be done here, actually, a big chunk of it. The trigger and the DAT, that, the trigger represents the system that decides whether or not we record an event. That's a fast processing uh, and evaluation system. The DAC is just the data acquisition. These have to be induced. And then we have to replace the end cap calorimeter. The end cap calorimeters have gotten so much radiation, the existing ones, that they're just not functioning. And they wouldn't be very useful for the high luminosity anyway. So I'm going to tell you about that system. The system we're going to upgrade is this piece here, okay? this nose cone. This, uh, what we call the N-plus uh, calorimeter. This shows you um, the kind of radiation we're anticipating uh, this detector will see by the time we finish running in 2035 or 2037. And this is a, um, a, a kind of a temperature map of that radiation showing the number of equivalent number of neutrons per square centimeter that those parts of the experiment will see. And you see that down here, close to the beam line, <coughs> where the piece right in the middle, there, we get up to 10 to the 16 uh, neutrons per square centimeter. So that's several hundred megarads, or if you like, uh, several million grays. Now, I don't know how to really convert that to something you could really life, but I found one interesting measure, which is that, you know, the, when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, they measured the radiation, they estimated the radiation at 500 meters from the uh, detonation point, and it was five gray, okay? So this corresponds to roughly one million Hiroshima bombs in terms of uh, the amount of radiation that this part of the detector has to absorb. And we have to design systems that can handle that, and uh, we think we know how to do that, actually. So we're using silicon, um, and 
we're going to build what we call a high granularity calorimeter, an HPC, with a vacuum Poisson calorimeter, not entirely out of uh, silicon. And it'll have 28 layers, um, alternating between silicon and uh, tungsten. Tungsten is used to basically stop particles, have them interact, produce lots of secondary particles which just interact and initiate a shower of many, many particles that produce signals in the silicon that are in alternating layers. And then later, uh, we switch from tungsten to brass. The silicon layers will be, uh, depending how close you get to the beam line, will be thinner and thinner silicon because it turns out it's harder and harder to operate silicon in high radiation. And one way to make it easier for high voltage properties is to make it thinner. And basically, we're going to exchange a, dete a detector that has about 20,000 channels with one that has about 6 million. So that's what I mean by granularity. We're going to go from a fairly coarse system, 20,000 pixels, to 6 million. So this is involves uh, roughly 600 square meters of silicon sensors, 22,000 modules. I'll explain what that is. Uh, 92,000 front end um, readout chips. And the power of this device will be about 120 kilowatts. This doesn't sound like a lot, but we have to run it at minus 30 degrees, so it's going to take some effort. Now, we've done studies in radiation of silicon, and here you see the signal um, for 200, uh, 300 micron silicon, um, which flourishes up to 10 to the 15. Do I have that right? The 200 pic, uh, micron pic silicon flourishes up to about 500 to 15, and then with about 140 micron pic silicon, it flourishes up to 1.5 times 10 to the 15. And these represent the radiation doses received at different ranges um, of radius from the beam line. This will be the worst case. We'll have the thinnest silicon, and you can see the signal drops with radiation by about a factor of two. Meantime, you produce lots of defects in the silicon from all this radiation causes a lot of dark things, and that's shown here. So it's increasing the light that's coming through. But um, what's important to note, too, is that all the data points match very well the theoretical expectations. So we can predict very well how the silicon will behave, and we are confident that if we operate the machine properly, we can survive the entire length of operation. One of the nice things about this uh, detector, it has very good, relatively good uh, energy resolution. The uncertainty on the energy over the energy itself goes like a constant over square root of energy plus a constant term. The first term is called the stochastic, stochastic term. This is called the, the constant term, which is obvious. But um, this term becomes small, the one that goes with one over square root of e, if the energy is high. And it turns out the particles that go into the forward direction of the energy very high, so that's great. What's important for us, therefore, is this constant term, which is under a percent. This shows, as I said, particles go in, they start hitting tungsten, they start interacting, producing other secondaries which interact. We develop a shower that's spreading as it goes deeper into this detector. This shows roughly the lateral size of the, of the shower as a function of the layer. And what happens, which is very nice, that the size of the shower remains very small for many of the first um, interaction depths. And this allows us to see individual particles as they're interacting, which has never really been done before in a calorimeter uh, in one of these experiments. This shows the structure of the thing. Um, we're considering various designs, but basically we're thinking about building it out of pie slices, which we call uh, well, wedges. And um, it's rather difficult to work this all out, partly because it's a heavy object. It's about 52 uh, tons, metric tons. But the basic element then is um, this kind of pizza slice, we call it the set. It has individual modules uh, which are hexagonal silicon wafers with readout electronics uh, built into it, and they're slid into these wedges that I described before. This shows all of the various services that go along with this, the cooling tubes, fast links uh, for readout, low voltage copper, high voltage cabling, et cetera. This is the pr 
prototype module. This is the tungsten base plate. There's a Teflon gold foil. Then there's the sensor, which is silicon. And then there's a readout uh, board that's shown here. So there's a full sink. There'll be 64 channels per readout chip, probably four to eight chips per module. And the data throughput will be something like 20 uh, billion bits per second for each of these readout chips. So this detector is going to produce a lot of data. Uh, we estimate that that uh, 200 pileups um, will be producing about a half a petabit per second, which is about uh, 80 terabytes per second, which is about a thousand times the global internet size, which is from other relations to it. So we have to figure out how to handle all that data, how to how to reduce it, and then read it out. And that's what we're working on now. And I think. I think there are ways to do that, believe it or not. There's one other interesting aspect of this thing. It turns out that the way we read out the electronics is very, very small jitter in the timing of the electronics. And that jitter is about 50 picoseconds, 50 billion uh, trillionths of a second. And so when we have an electromagnetic shower, as the one I described before, where you're producing more and more particles that are lighting up more and more channels of the silicon, each one of those measurements has sort of a 50, 50 picosecond uncertainty. And so the entire shower of some statistics will have an uncertainty in time of about 10 trillionths of a, of a second. So if we, we can possibly um, retain that precision and understand when these interactions occur at the 10 picosecond level, it means we may be able to understand exactly where the particles are originated. Because 10 picoseconds at the speed of light is three millimeters. So it'll give us sort of three millimeter resolution on where the inter interaction occurs. And so of all those 200 interactions that we're looking at, we'll be able to isolate um, very well which sort of 10 or 20 to consider. And that will help us to deal with this pileup. All right, so here's some event displays. I just wanted to show you, you can see as particles come in, they clearly leave sort of single particle showers in the early layers, which is quite nice. So we can look at particles and really start to see, uh, look at showers and really start to see what's going on. This is an event for, um, I think, 140 pileups. And you can see the end cap is completely filled with that. If you just take a little segment, you see that there's lots of activity. But the important thing is that this detector allows you to kind of track particles almost at the single particle level in many, many this is the uh, this is a single event. The colors correspond to different um, clusterings of the signals. But if you this is without discriminating the signals in any way. But if you actually weight weight them by how much charge is there, like how many particles are going through individual pads, you start to see again individual particle tracks very well. So the detector has a tremendous amount of power, and this is not with, uh, taking into account the timing. So once you bring in the timing, this kind of resolution becomes four-dimensional. And um, it could be really powerful for lots of physics uh, experiments beyond even the LHC. Now, the last thing I wanted to show you about this was how well it performs. Um, these curves are a little bit hard to read, probably, but you'll understand, I think. This shows um, background rejection versus signal efficiency. The green is this new detector, OK, which is a very high efficiency. The red would be if we hadn't changed out the old detector. Okay, it just starts to really die. And the blue is what we would get with the current detector before any radiation damage occurs to it. So you see we're doing extremely well. And then we have similar kinds of, of curves here, where in, in every case we're doing better with this detector after lots of radiation than the current detector before any radiation. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to show you, we built a, actually a little test room uh, mock-up where we had about 16 layers of these uh, detectors with tungsten in between. And we looked at what happens. This is the actual layout. So you see 200 micron active system silicon. And um, it behaved well. So we predicted the signal-to-noise ratio should be 7. And that's what we found. The response is very linear as a function of energy a little bit higher than our simulations predicted. So it functions very, very well. And 
we're looking forward to see what happens. But there are many challenges ahead for this detector. As I said, we have this huge data rate on the order of 10,000 uh, gigabytes per second that we have to deal with. Somehow we have to crunch that down to a much, much smaller volume to be able to read it out. 100 kilowatts uh, is a lot of energy to dissipate at minus 30 C. And the construction is very tricky. There's something like 100,000 cables that have to transit from coal to, to room temperature. Anyone who's built detectors that run gold knows what a headache this is going to be. But we're working at it. All right, last thing I wanted to do was to finish up by saying what, what happens after the LHC? What, what else are we considering? So looking even further ahead and speculating even further, I'll show you a few of the machines that are being considered. So I talked about the LHC, which is 27 kilometers around. That's, this is a picture showing where they are. This is the first accelerator turn, second, third. Now they're considering this one, which actually leaves the valley, goes around that mountain range, and comes back. That's called the FTC, the Future um, Circular Collider. They're considering either an 80-kilometer ring. This is the LAC. They're considering either an 80-kilometer ring or uh, 100 kilometers. And this would allow us to study electroweak symmetry breaking, the Higgs mechanism, if you like, and the unification of the, of the forces to very high, uh, well, to very high energy scales. Really understand the Higgs potential extremely well. Look for peak symmetry to very high masses. There's also the possibility of an intermediate step where you put an electron positron collider in here and you study the Higgs and break the scale WG up. I like to joke that if they decide, if they start building this and then they decide to cancel it like they did in the US, I hope they start with this section because at least then we'd still have a fast way into town. It would be very difficult to find the funding for this right now. A lot of things have to be understood, and there's a group that's actually just studying this to produce a report in the next couple of years. <coughs> and um, we'll have to see what's found and, and what needs to be done after that. In China, there's some consideration of what I would call the Great Ring of China. In China, there's a lot of debate going on about building a, a circular collider here, right where the Great Wall of China starts up, which is why I called it the Great Ring of China. Here's a close-up view of a couple of possible uh, accelerator locations and sizes. There's also the consideration of linear machines. There's the International Linear Collider in Japan. This, this would be an electron-positron machine, which would allow you to study the Higgs coupling to much less than 1%. You would really understand what new physics you're dealing with uh, pretty well, actually, because there's so many different models in this. Not only just due to discrepancies, and there's the possibility of building uh, a linear collider at CERN called SPACE, which would allow us to get to very high energy eventually. It's the basis of peak extendedness. Uh, it has very, very high fuel gradients, and you can get to much higher energy. All right, so let me finish up. Here's the outlook. This is this huge experimental program extending ma many decades into the future. Um, we're developing instruments with unprecedented capabilities, actually, and possibly some interesting applications beyond our field. There'll be both accelerator and non-accelerator experiments working for dark matter. There are actually dozens and dozens of experiments being developed. So I think we will make contact, so to speak, with dark matter sometime in the not too distant future. I don't want to predict exactly when, but it seems unlikely that we will go much, much longer. And that will be very interesting. So these are challenging but exciting times, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, for this inspiring talk. So we have plenty of time for questions. Maybe we'll get the lights. Uh, Brad? They, they, it depends what kind of damage. They, they cause, um, they don't cause bulk damage to silicon, for example, not much, except for what, to the extent that they produce nuclear interaction, which is much different. So you have less bulk damage to silicon, <coughs> but you know, um, photons are the main source of damage to surface electrons. So, um, but I think for, for us, for the sensors we would be building, the devices we would be building, we would 
be in pretty good shape, yeah, radiation-wise. I think we still have to do design and use radiation tolerance to some extent. Yeah. Over there. It's absolutely true that there's a limit to how well we can do on the haze. Uh, on certain certain companies, we can't measure at all. We cannot see haze to haze to charm or, or life form. We hope to see, not too distant future, maybe in the next 10 years, haze to haze and muons. And that would be the first time we've seen uh, any connection to the second generation of particles. At um, an E plus E minus collider, you have a very different situation. And, and the reason for that is the backgrounds are just too large, okay? Also, the calculations are difficult because you're, you're convoluting. When you collide protons, you're not actually colliding two point particles. You're colliding a, a bag of quarks and gluons with another bag of quarks and gluons. And then what actually will collide will be a quark with a gluon or a gluon with a gluon or a quark with a quark. And there are probability distributions for how much of the proton momentum they carry, okay? So in any event, you're not sure exactly how much that was, and there's fairly big uncertainty. Uh, there's some uncertainty. There are also theoretical uncertainties on some of the calculations for these processes. So we're limited by systematics to some extent. So in an E plus and minus collider, you're actually colliding point particles. You know exactly the energy. The calculations are fairly straightforward. Um, by comparison, they're not trivial. Is anyone doing them out there? Excuse me. I know they're hard. And, uh, and you get incredible precision. And I can just show you here, for instance, this shows um, what they would get for the coupling and uh, at, at, at the uh, ILC, OK, compared to what you'd expect from the standard model. And you see that for different types of new physics, they'd really be able to see, for instance, in this case, this would be supersymmetry, I believe, a particular model of supersymmetry, and this is a model of composite case. And you can actually, you have good enough precision to distinguish what those are, even though the coupling, the discrepancies are quite small. So there is a lot of reason to build a haze factory, absolutely. That should be something that's done. Other questions? There. The pile up becomes a, um, I would say it's more difficult when you're looking for events where um, the main final state does not lose particle track. As an example, heat for two photons, there's no track to the photon. But if we don't know exactly where the birth text plate came from, our measurement will be off, the resolution is, is disturbed. Because as you can imagine, when you reconstruct the initial state, you have to know not only the energy, but the direction to get the full three vector or four vector right. So we need to know the, we need to know the interaction vertex for at least uh, a centimeter or less. So um, pileup is really tough for that kind of an event. And that's one of the benchmarks we're using to design this detector. But with the things I mentioned, with the, with the fact that we could, if one of the photons goes in the forward direction into this detector, we can determine which region of the vertex line, you know, of the beam line, it came from to, to about the level we need, about a few two mil, uh, millimeters or a centimeter. So we recover. We, we get, we get uh, you know, we get, it, they, every bunch has uh, roughly the same density of protons, and we get roughly 200 plus or minus square root of 200 or whatever. We can't tune it, no. Well, you, you could go to, say say you wanted to go to lower pileup to, to study the H2 photon. You'd also be going to lower luminosity, meaning, meaning the probability you, you would wait much longer to get to the statistics. So if we want to get to high statistics, we have to deal with the pileup. But there are precision measurements like WMAPs where people seriously consider having a special yes. run at low luminosity. For, 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 for a process like a W, which has a very high cross-section, you can run at low luminosity and, and for 
this is not going to be an issue, but for the Hays, it's, you know, it's very rare. You have to get as much amount as you can, so you have to find ways to, to localize these things. Yeah. Gunk. Unless there's a real catastrophe, we we probably will not replace them. Um, oops, oops. Let, me, let me put it this way: we are to some extent we consider this like a satellite launch, so we have to design things to be extremely robust. We install. It's very unlikely we're going to get a chance to open up and fix anything. So that all of that goes into our design. Everything has to be really robust, and uh, you have to be paranoid about everything. Anything that goes in has to be radiation tested to understand what happens to it. Any hot screws we lose, any materials we lose. So fortunately, a lot of that has been going on for the last generation or so. So we have a lot of information, and we know a lot of things about how to design it. But um, it's, it's a satellite launch to a large extent, especially for the detector I described here. Any other questions? So let me ask you one. So you have been working on many different things during your career in particle physics. So you told us several directions, uh, yeah. which are interesting. But uh, what kind of physics are you going to work on in the next three or four years? Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking, I, I, like I said, uh, I think the most compelling thing to, to me is dark matter. My group is studying at CERN. Uh, we're looking for dark matter by looking for supersymmetric physics. But in some sense, we're using supersymmetry as a proxy for general searches for dark matter. And, uh, and we're, we're hedging our bet a little bit by looking for final states that include top quarks, because we know there's this problem with the haze and the coupling of the haze to the top and its partner. So I think supersymmetry and, and, and well, dark matter. Somebody's got to find that. I, mean, I would be not upset if it was me. <laughs> Steve. Absolutely. Well, so the question is why look, at, look for it at the LHC since people are looking for it in many ways. The, the thing about dark matter is it interacts very, very weakly. We know that. I mean, there's, there's 100 ton blocks of dark matter passing through this auditorium right now. And it wouldn't bother you. you know, so it only interacts uh, gravitationally. Of what you know, we're only sure that it interacts gravitationally, but we think it must interact a little bit with the standard models we have thermalized in the early universe and get the distributions we have. So it, there's some weak interaction that it has, and um, there are many ways we have to look for it. And the common there are three ways: one with the accelerator, another using underground experiments where you're actually waiting for dark matter to give you a signal by banging into a very, very cold nuclear lab, creating a uh, phonons or possibly some ionization. And there are satellite experiments looking for traces of annihilation of dark matter in space, you know, toward the galactic center and things like this, where you see possibly photons at a particular energy repeated over and over, or look for antimatter being produced. And all of these searches, of which there are now dozens and dozens, right? Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll start to see dark matter somewhere, see some interaction somewhere, and we'll see some trace of it in all three cases, because it may take all three to help us figure out what its properties are. Uh, because in each of these different things, you make different assumptions about what it's doing. For instance, the case where it's annihilating, you're assuming it is its own antiparticle, perhaps, so it can annihilate with itself. So it's, it's, it's a tough thing, but it's 85% of the matter in the universe. It drives us crazy. How can we you know, call ourselves particle physics? We're only 15% you know, done explaining stuff. So we got to find it. And that'll be a big discovery. Maybe time for one last question. If not, let's uh, thank Joe again.